Women to Watch is an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. It's so great to be here with all of you. Joining me in just a moment, my guest for this week will be Christina Wallace. Christina is a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, and she is also an angel investor and an author of her most recent book, The Portfolio Life, which was just released in April. So we'll be talking about all of those different things that Christina is involved with. As always, stay with us during the breaks where you'll hear from our exclusive watch team of on-air contributors bringing you news and information from their organizations and their industries. And for all information on the show, you can visit womentowatch.net. That's women, the number two, watch.net, N-E-T. So now I'm very excited and honored to welcome to the show, Christina Wallace. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Christina. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day uh, to share your story with us. <laughs> I'm excited. I am um, of course, I want to start with your beginning, and I wonder if you could just tell our audience um, where you grew up and a little bit about the community there. Sure. So I grew up in Lansing, Michigan. Um, it is the capital of Michigan, even if most people think it's Detroit. It's not Lansing. <laughs> and um, and Lansing is known for kind of two things. It was this, like a, one of the biggest manufacturing centers for General Motors for a very long time. And it's right next to East Lansing, which is Michigan State University. And that is a lot of what informed my family's, uh, you know, existence. My grandfather built cars for General Motors for 40 some years. And my mom was a secretary at the university. And I was raised by my mom and my maternal grandparents. Um, plus an older sister we made for a nice little fivesome. And it was a pretty modest childhood. Um, you know, we, we never uh, ran out of money, but we never really had a surplus. And so there was a, a very much a mentality of, um, you know, you do absolutely everything you can with the resources you've been given and you don't squander opportunities. Um, and you work really hard because a scholarship to college is kind of your only way out. Yeah. Um, and I think those things really informed the work ethic and the discipline that I developed uh, in childhood, along with, um, I, you know, in some ways I was, I think, very lucky because the expectations around who I might become were so low that there weren't specific, you know, expectations put on me. No one was saying you got to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. And so the sky was the limit because no limit was ever placed there. Yeah. I know that your grandmother um, had a huge impact on you. And I wonder if you can talk about her a little bit and what, what exactly was it that influenced who you are today? Yeah. So my grandmother was such an interesting character. Her name was Arlene. Um, she grew up as one of 11 children on a farm, uh, very poor. And her father died at a young age, ended up with uh, an abusive stepfather. And so um, was, was one of the oldest children and really had to be responsible for raising her siblings. Um, when she met my grandfather, ended up getting married and starting her own family, she then became the person who people would go in and spend a few years with or uh, a stint with when they needed to get back on their feet. And so when my mom and, and father's marriage fell apart, she moved back home um, and, and that's where we stayed. And that's, uh, it's, I literally was born, uh, you know, in, in my grandmother's house. And so oh, um, wow. she became very much like my mother, to be honest. Um, it was, uh, it was my grandmother that I called home from college when I needed to talk to someone. And what was so interesting about that relationship, you know, she, she barely graduated high school. She certainly never went to college. 
And she didn't have a ton of access to anything when she was growing up. And so she, she cared deeply about trying to find access, even if we couldn't pay for it, how else might we get, a, a, you know, a, a afford of it um, for me and my sister to have music lessons, to get a great education, to really, um, to get out, you know, to do so much more. And um, she was very strict. She was this five foot three redheaded spark of a matriarch. Um, but she cared deeply about me and my sister and, and helping us become the absolute best we could be. Not only that, I would imagine, you know, she went through some very, very difficult times, right? Yeah. Um, and I wonder if she instilled some sense in you of um, resilience, right? I mean, anything that probably came your way that you thought was a big problem and a challenge, she may have you know, brought some perspective. This abused you. me of that notion. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's hard. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's very true. And I think, you know, our, our childhood was not without bumps as well, given um, the complications of my parents' divorce. And I think, you know, having, having her there along with my grandfather, just surrounding us with support, as well as a little bit of like, okay, get back on your feet and let's keep going um, was, was, you know, both the carrot and the stick to, uh, to really give us the discipline, the resilience, the, yeah. the motivation to, um, to not ever wallow, which mm. became really important later on when I came into the world of entrepreneurship and I experienced some failures for the first time. Um, knowing that forward motion is the only way you get out of whatever, you know, muck you're in was a really helpful lesson in those moments. Yeah. Can you tell me what the hardest part of not having your father around was, you know, how? You know, it's funny. I've, I've been asked that question so many times in my life, but I don't, I don't know what it would have been like. I never had a father. Um, you know, I, I had some occasional, you know, visitations with him when we were younger and then he stepped out of the picture entirely. And so it, it was never a loss that I felt. It was just a different family. I had three parents, not two. Yeah. And, you know, two of my parents were rather old school in their values and in their vocabulary um, and in their media references and how they saw the world. Um, and it really wasn't until I got married and had my own children that I realized I had no idea what the role of the father was supposed mm. to be. Wow. Um, and it, it then required some pretty explicit conversations between me and my husband about how we were going to think about raising our children and, and what our relationship to each other and to them would be. And um, I just, I, I didn't have that default for good or for bad. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, you talked about loving math and being mm -hmm. mostly self-taught. And I thought, mm -hmm. gosh, how does, how does anyone self-teach <laughs> math, which was probably my worst subject ever. <laughs> um, I, I think it had to do a little bit with the school that you went to. Talk about that experience. And, I, and I'm curious if there was, was there any teacher that recognized you were not being challenged mm. and you really needed more? Yeah, it's interesting. So I went to a very uh, small evangelical Christian private school. Um, my my family was and and somewhat remains um, sort of very conservative, uh, almost like Pentecostal Christian uh, uh, religious. And so the religious education was the priority over the academic education. And, and that's how we ended up at this school. And so the, the challenge there was twofold. One, almost none of the teachers were accredited in the subjects that they were okay. teaching. <laughs> and number two... <laughs> The, the school was so small. I mean, my, my grade was maybe 12 to 14 students a year. Yeah. So that if you needed anything out of the ordinary, it was kind of like, okay, but that's on you, figure it out. And yeah. so from a very young age, it became clear that I was quite advanced academically and in particular in math. Um, and at about third or fourth grade, the, the solution, I don't even remember how it was presented, but the solution was sort of like, go in the corner, we'll give you the textbook of the year ahead of you, or the year ahead of that, and read it, do the problem sets, the answers are in the back, you can grade it, and you'll see if you learned it oh, or not, and then you tell us when you're ready to take the exam, and we'll give it to you. 
and you can go as fast as you want. That was the, the big upside. And so I did. And I went two, three, four years ahead of my peers in math by reading the textbook. And this is obviously pre-internet. There's no Googling. There's no Khan Academy. It was like, let's hope yeah. the textbook explains it really well. But I loved math. I spoke it fluently. It just made sense to me. And mm -hmm. getting to go at my own pace and teach myself, I think ended up being a huge advantage over having an unaccredited teacher who wasn't even sure they knew the content trying to teach it. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this um, kind of ability and the flexibility of kind of teaching myself in the corner, I ended up becoming the default tutor for like every athlete and, you know, every other student who was struggling, they're like, oh, go, go see Christina. <laughs> and so <laughs> she knows a virtue. <laughs> Never, I mean, at some point, my mother was like, I'm paying for this school, but you seem to be teaching everyone else. <laughs> but having to teach other people material really forces you to understand it. Um, and that was one of the well, first here times. Here you are today. I mean, I, uh, it's interesting, that connection between <laughs> yeah. where you started and being a senior lecturer at Harvard. Yes. Um, it's probably very, very closely tied. I'm you sure. Know, I mean, I, I ended up learning, loving, explaining things to people, particularly people who didn't get it the first time. Or I'm like, yeah. okay, let me get creative. Let's find another way to make fractions or integrals make sense. And, um, and so it became really this huge uh, identity for me, being this mm -hmm. kind of math nerd um, who was a loner. Um, and I think that also helped that I never, because I was such an outsider, I didn't have a lot of I didn't have any friends, let's be honest, until about 15. Um, and I was so deeply ensconced in classical music training, piano, cello, and voice, and then math. I was just like, everyone just accepted. Like, she's that weirdo. She's the loner. Like, let her do her thing. And as a result, like, peer pressure, following the path that everyone else was taking, none of that ever was an, a factor for me. It was always, I'm going to be different. So... Let's just be different. Yeah, that's that's amazing in, in itself because I think for young girls in particular, their mm -hmm. peers have such an effect on them. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you had the ability to really be alone, you know, forging your own path and not let that bother you. I wonder if the fact- Oh, it that definitely bothered me. <laughs> oh, it did bother but, you. Oh. But the solution wasn't any, right? Like- to make friends with the kids I was going to school with and to go at their pace didn't seem like a better option. Yeah. You know, I was it definitely was lonely, um, okay. but it is what it is. You know, it's, yeah. it worked. Yeah. It worked. And did you gain confidence in the fact that people were coming to you, both adults and, and your peers as well for help, for guidance? Mm -hmm. I think if someone looks to you for yes. advice, that would boost confidence. Oh, for sure. And and certainly academically, I had a ton of confidence and knowing that, you know, as a seventh grader, they were sending the 11th grade, you know, basketball team to me to keep them on the team so they could, you know, pass their exams. Um, and I had always really connected with the teachers, okay. not so much my peers, but the teachers and the older students I, I could have that connection with. Um, but I did miss the socialization, the friendships, the having to navigate interpersonal conflict. Like that wasn't something I even experienced until I went to boarding school. My last two years of high school, I ended up going to Interlochen Arts Academy, which is a boarding school for the performing arts in Northern Michigan. And what was so interesting there, I went there as a piano major. I was studying classical piano very, very seriously, practicing like six hours a day. Wow. But I knew even when I left for boarding school that I didn't want to be a professional musician. Many students who go to Interlochen do, and that's the path they end up on. And, and I was using it much more as a, a way to get out. <laughs> I wanted something bigger. Yeah. And when I got to Interlochen, they had one team in the whole school, and it was the math team. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I joined the math team and I had a teacher there, Mrs. Kamishki, who was my, literally my first math teacher ever in 11th grade. Wow. And, um, and she saw what I had to offer and she ran with it. Mm. And we did, uh, uh, I took AP uh, calculus with her as a junior. And then I did an independent study with her as a senior and just had this incredible 
experience where finally I had someone that I could talk to about these things and who could challenge me beyond the textbooks. And she is the reason I was a math major in college. So when you're, when you're do, when you're immersed in that, what are you thinking? What do you do with a math degree? What do you do? I mean, I know you're, you're a serial entrepreneur and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, you're just incredibly successful now in your career, Mm -hmm. but your initial focus was music. So how did you make that transition between a degree in math and really getting more involved in business? And yeah, yeah, we'll talk about, um, Quincy Apparel. Yeah, we had some zigs and zags in there. So I I decided not to go to conservatory. I wanted to go to college instead. And I knew a math major would be part of my education. But when I got to college, I went to Emory University in Atlanta. And when I showed up, you know, I knew from day one, I'm going to be a math major. But I was like, but that's not all I'm going to study. Like, what else is there? And so I kind of dabbled a little bit in their music department. And to be honest, it was a bit of a letdown after Interlochen's experience. And so I was like, well, I'm not going to be a music major. I can do a minor. I'll play in the orchestra and sing in the choir and, and sort of do all of that. But it won't be, I won't be serious about it. <laughs> and instead, as my artistic uh, kind of endeavors, I fell into the theater community um, and decided to double major in math and theater. Uh, and then was able to do minors in music, physics, and political science because I was paying a flat tuition no matter how many credits I took. And so really it was like burnout was the limit. Um, and as long as I could keep going, I could do what I wanted. And and I will be, I will be a little bit naive about this, but I didn't think about jobs until maybe two months before I graduated, like, like the, what happens after college was just never on my radar. Yeah. I spent my summers, uh, as a carpenter at Georgia Shakespeare festival and doing research in physics labs. I, I was doing interesting things and I was making money doing it. I also worked as an assistant director at a big, um, uh, church in Atlanta. I was the assistant director of music. And so I, I had things going, but there was never a, like, something happens after graduation (laughs) until the moment that I was like, Oh crap, something happens after graduation. Um, and so there was this, this moment of like, do I pick the arts or do I pick math? Mm. And I chose the arts, uh, right out of school. I did a one year kind of fellowship at, uh, at Emory in their arts department. And that bought me some space to really think about it. And I applied to PhD programs in math. And as I started visiting them, I was like, this is not a fit for me. Like they want me to focus on one very tiny problem in mathematics that like a dozen people in the world care about. And I'm going to have to focus on that for like seven years. Like this is not, this is not a fit. So I was like, okay, I'm not doing math. We're going to double down on the arts. And after my year long fellowship, I moved to New York to work at the Metropolitan Opera. Wow. And I got this job on the management side of the house. So I showed up and was kind of like, I'll do anything. I'm broke. And um, and they brought me into the rehearsal department, which the opera is so big at, at the Met. There's only a few opera companies in the world that are big enough to need an entire department for this. But I ended up in this kind of the nucleus of the artistic department where I was overseeing and helping move all the pieces together to make all the different rehearsals and performances fit in a repertory model. So we would have at any given time, six, seven, eight operas in repertory, trading off every night, rehearsing one thing during the day, performing a different thing that evening. The cast would often overlap across these things. And then, you know, throughout this, you've got 18 different unions at the Met. The stagehands are different from the orchestra, which is different from the ballet, Sounds which is different from the singers. Producing? What we should I was producing. Produce? Okay. That's exactly it. It's operations and producing. I just didn't have the language for it yet. But I realized in doing this work that I loved it. I loved having this high level view of all of the moving pieces. I loved mm. the math and the operations and the, the strategy of it. And I spoke the language of the musicians and the artists. I understood their world because I had come from that world, but I also could think about the business side of it. So when I I, uh, started feeling a little bit frustrated by the lack of innovation and the lack of interest in trying new things at the Met. And now to be fair, I was 22 and I was far too big for my own britches. So (laughs) I don't entirely... (laughs) 
judge my bosses for their reaction. But it became clear to me, the Met and the opera world in general, it's not an industry that's growing. And so mm -hmm. growth for me as an individual was not going to happen until someone above me died or retired. Mm -hmm. And everyone above me was like healthy and in their 50s. And I was like, well, this is going to be a long wait. Um, and that's when I decided to go to business school. Okay. I didn't know anyone who'd ever had an MBA. I didn't actually even know what business school meant. But I had an inkling that an arts management master's degree would be like, a baby MBA combined with all these other arts classes that I felt like I'd already had had hmm. and a, a real MBA with marketing and finance and accounting and strategy and all these things. And I was like, I think that's going to make a bigger impact. If I'm going to take two years off of earning money, I'm going to take out loans. Let's go the business school route. But the plan had always been to come back to the arts. I wanted to run Lincoln center or the Kennedy center someday. And then I got to business school and the economy fell apart. Lehman Brothers collapsed my third week of my MBA program. What year was that, Christine? 2008. 2008. And, um, and it was very clear, very quickly, there were no jobs, certainly no jobs in the nonprofit arts world for a while. And that's when I had to get creative. And Harvard as an institution, I did my MBA at Harvard. Um, as an institution, we started to really focus on entrepreneurship for the first time. It was an inflection point in our curriculum um, in saying, well, if there are no jobs, go create some, go be an entrepreneur and build a company. And that was a huge revelation to me that what I loved about making theater and opera and art, a lot of those same elements were there in early stage entrepreneurship. You know, this having that idea. <laughs> Journey. You were born to be an entrepreneur. And I think <laughs> you know, you're unique in that you're so gifted in multiple areas, multiple areas of the brain. Um, seriously, you know, you, you excel. So I think entrepreneurship was just your destiny because you, you know, enjoying producing and managing and organizing moving parts, but also creating, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's something that, you know, you, you needed to, to do that and you needed yeah. to find a way to do that. Yes. Um, we have to go into our first break and I have a million more questions for you when we come back. Stay with us for our watch team and we will be back with Christina Wallace. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. If you think severe weather has been on the rise, you are correct. In the last three years, tornado warnings in our region have shattered records. With 52 last year alone, half of those warnings resulted in confirmed tornadoes, including two extremely rare EF3s. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. Welcome back to Philly Watch. So Ben. Yes. Is it safe to say that history is Philadelphia's bread and butter? I mean, you know I'm a food girl, but there is no denying that people travel from all over the world to experience our history. Is it safe to say that there's no better place to celebrate the nation's birthday than Philadelphia? Oh, that's like hands down, no doubt. I know this, and I know that you know mm -hmm. this. I think they know it too. Absolutely. Philly is the place to be every single day, but especially for July 4th. Trust me when I say there's no city that throws a party like Philly throws a party. And you know how I spend my birthday month celebrating all month oh, long? Oh, I know how you celebrate your birthday, yes. <laughs> well, it's definitely the Philly girl in May because Philly celebrates July 4th for almost three weeks. Oh my gosh, and if we're bringing that same energy we did for your birthday to July 4th, it's gonna be an epic celebration. Oh, without a doubt. And now that we've been voted the most walkable city in the U.S., everyone can easily get to all of the amazing programming happening all month long and be a part of it all. 100%. I mean, I'm really looking forward to Wawa Hoagie Day at Independence Hall, where there's going to be first responders, military members, and just everyday heroes competing in a hoagie building competition. And they're giving away 25,000 free hoagies. Like, Wawa Hoagies are everything. If you know, you know. I'm most excited for the free museum days at more than 30 of the city's top attractions. I'm definitely going to check out the African American Museum. I love the National Constitution Center and Eastern State Penitentiary gets me every time. And there's so many new exhibitions at all of the museums. And there is no 4th of July celebration without fireworks. And we have several nights of it on the waterfront, at the Phillies game, and of course on the parkway after the Wawa Welcome America July 4th concert, which this year is headlined by Demi Lovato and Ludacris. 
Philly is about to be insane, and the only way to experience it is to be here. Yes, Luda, the 90s baby in me is screaming. And I'm screaming right next to you, so. I mean, you better be. Uh, check out visitphilly.com for everything July 4th and to book your stay. We'll see you here. At Action News, we cherish every moment. And it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Hi, and welcome back to the show. I'm doing this with by Christina Wallace. And Christina is a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School. She is also an angel investor and the author of The Portfolio Life, which we will absolutely talk about. That's her most recent book. Um, I, I wanted to kind of jump ahead just because of our limited time. And every entrepreneur talks about lessons in, in failure, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you started a company, Quincy Apparel, with a classmate at Harvard. Mm -hmm. I always say how much guts it takes to say, let's start a company. You know, you have an idea um, and there's just so much to think about. So I guess... It, I believe it was three years before you had to shut the company down. Was it three years? A little bit less, yeah. yeah. Um, when you think about all the lessons, because I'm sure there were many, what, what was the most important for you that you took to your next venture? Would you mm. say? There were a couple uh, that really kind of became crucial as I thought about the next thing I wanted to build and the thing after that. The first one was... Alex and I were great friends, but we were not great co-founders. Mm. We, uh, we overlapped far too much in our skill sets and in our networks oh. to bring different things to the table, right? There were too many times where both of us could raise our hand and say, I'll take that. <laughs> or, you know, when we go to solve a problem, we both know the one person, the same person to go to. And at the same time, there were all these gaps in the things that neither of us knew. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was this desire to co-found this um, company because we both shared the same problem that we were trying to solve. We, we resonated deeply with the customer problem that, that we were tackling. And we loved the idea of building this company together, but we weren't great co-founders. And so as I thought about the next things I was building, the, the difference between a great friend and a great co-founder um, became really important to ensure that I had the right people at the table with me. And the question of whether I even wanted a co-founder for mm -hmm. the next things that I build versus thinking about who my initial team would be and really making sure I had the right people at the table there. Yeah. That Another big failure from that or uh, learning from that failure was simply just the number of things outside of your control. That there's a lot that you can do and strategize and think through and and make smart decisions in. And then there's a lot that you have absolutely no control over. And you know, for every story of a success that you see, you could go back and I, I promise if you talk with those founders, they could point to one or two decisions where it could have gone the other way. And their huge success could have been a failure relegated to the dustbins of history, right? For, for if not for a lucky break or two. So there was a little bit of that humility of how little control you have over mm -hmm. building anything over life in general, I think. And then the last one was simply how much I wanted to keep doing it as hard as it was. Um, and as financially unrewarding as that failure was, <laughs> I learned so much. I got to build something that didn't exist before I showed up to do it. And I got to work with people that I chose on problems that I was interested in. And it was so incredibly fulfilling to have an idea and then to go do something about it at the speed that you can in a startup. Then I knew basically from that point on, I would never go back to a big company. How did the, um, I always think about the financials and the beginning and the, and the you need money, right? So yeah. you need money at the start. And that's the thing that I think would keep me up at night the most. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have? You know, if someone's watching, a woman's watching, and she's contemplating perhaps starting her own business, mm -hmm. um, what was, worked for you and what didn't with regard to that? Yeah. So we went down a path of angel and venture capital, which for our time and our backgrounds uh, as MBA students was sort of the default that was presented. When you talked about entrepreneurship, you meant 
venture backed tech startups. Um, and that came with pros and cons, right? The big upside to venture capital is it's not your money. And if you fail, you don't have to pay it back. You're not on the hook for anything. And, and there is an expectation that a majority of startups fail. And so you're not burning bridges. A failure doesn't mean you've lost all respect from your investors and they'll never back you again. Many times investors will absolutely back you again. So, so there was on the one hand, it's sort of like, I get to take a chance with other people's money. <laughs> Downside to that is a VC backed business has to look like a very specific type of business. It has to have a technology play for the most part. It has to have, we call a 10 X outcome, a, a, you know, a giant growth curve that can return 10 times the investment to the venture capitalists. And, and if you only have a moderate growing business, a, a cash flow generating business, but not one that's going to be huge, that's not re really venture backable. And so if you take VC money, it leads you down a very specific path of the type of business you're going to be expected to build and the growth rate you're going to be expected to go at. And I've seen many folks who've taken VC money for businesses they shouldn't have, and that forced them into a path that ultimately became a failure when it could have been a very successful business in a different financing path. So the other options are ones that might put a little more of your skin in the game, taking out a loan, maybe one that you have to secure, you have to collateralize off of your, your own assets, um, or building something that is revenue generating, hopefully from day one, and that can be a customer revenue funded business. So there are lots of different ways to finance depending on what you're building and what you aspire to. Uh, in my case, we kind of shot for the moon and failed trying. Which would you, I mean, what is the percentage of most um, entrepreneurs' first ventures? <laughs> Uh, the stats are kind of all over the place, depending on how you how you define it. But I think the 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 number that gets thrown around is somewhere between seventy to eighty five percent of uh, of ventures fail. Yeah. And failure is also you're like, well, how do you define failure? Um, roughly, that means does not return investor capital. Okay. Um, in you know a ten year time frame. Um, you can also look at statistics from the U.S. Department of Labor that shows that of all small businesses, not just venture backed, all small businesses or all businesses, um, like 70 percent are no longer in business by year 10. So it's a pretty high rate mm -hmm. um, of failure. But what's great, I think, at least about the way that we set up the business um, sector in the U.S. is as long as you don't lie or cheat or defraud someone, you're almost always given a second chance. Like a failed business is not a moral failing and that people in this sector really respect the, the chutzpah required to go out and try. Yeah. Um, you're taking a risk, right? Yeah. So anyone who takes a risk, that's, that's a, that's a good character trait, mm -hmm. you know? Um, Okay, let's talk about the book, The Portfolio Life. Sure. And I'm sure, you know, you, you wrote that because you have all these life lessons and um, the world talks about work versus personal life, right? Mm -hmm. And how can we make it work? So um, I, tell me the, the moment you decide, you know what, I'm going to write a book about what I've learned. And then I'll give you, you know, time to talk about the three tenets that sure. you described. So it came in uh, January of 2020. I, uh, I was three months out from having my first child. Um, I was about to go back from maternity leave, uh, go back to um, my, my job. I'd been um, on the executive team of a fast growing startup for three and a half years at that point. And I realized I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go back to that job. And in particular, I didn't want to go back to the pace that I'd been living for the last decade as an entrepreneur, because the type of mother I wanted to be, certainly at the earliest stages, and the type of entrepreneur I knew I was, didn't seem like they could work together. Mm. And so I, I knew I needed a new chapter for this season of life, a new way of putting together my professional pursuits, funding my life, all those things. I needed something different. And, um, and as I was 
I, I put in notice, I told them I wasn't coming back. And as I was thinking through what would that next step be, um, my agent who I'd worked with on my first book, which was around um, uh, innovation with inside large companies, she said, well, you've been writing about these ideas for a while. I had had a column for Forbes for many years. I'd been giving speeches on many of these kind of topics. She's like, well, let's pull them all together. Let's make, let's make this your next book. Um, and I realized it was it was a solution to my problem of what do I do as I'm thinking through what the next big move is professionally, but also how can I pull together this, this research and this line of thinking that I've been working on for quite a while in a way that it could then survive. Um, and that's where we decided to sit down and write the next book. In 2020, which we all know was the, the world turned upside Indeed. down. Indeed. So I ended up having a little bit more time than I thought to sit yeah. still uh, mm -hmm. and, you yeah. know, ended up joining the faculty here at Harvard in July of that year. But from January to July, I was able to work on the proposal and, and get this book in place. So it was um, it was absolutely perfect timing for for writing a book. Yeah. Do, do you want to talk about the three tenets and, you know, sure. So I, I joke that I wrote this book to explain my life to my mother, um, but it's also not a joke because you know everything that I'm writing is like, oh, I'm I'm also helping myself make sense of this. The the way I describe the three tenets of the portfolio life is that number one, you are more than any one thing, any one job or opportunity. Um, you have sort of a, a multi-dimensional identity if you see it and own it and identify it. Um, so that's that's the beginning. You're you're more than just your job. Number two, um, diversification <laughs> is your friend. It's how we mitigate uncertainty and navigate change because change is the new normal. Um, and then number three, when not if when you hit a different season of your life, when your priorities change, when your needs change, you can and should rebalance your portfolio in the same way that you rebalance your financial portfolio for different levels of risk and reward, different asset allocations. It's the same thing in your life. And I really do use the term portfolio life and not just portfolio career because you're, you're, work, your career is in the context of your life. And many times as you are rebalancing, you're thinking not just what do I care about next professionally, but how does that fit in with some of the other things that I have going on, whether it's caregiving or something I want to learn about or some health things that I might be going through that have changed what I'm capable of. Um, whatever that is, it's all in the context of your life. It's so true about change. Just it's it's going to happen. It does happen. It will happen. It's happening as we're sitting here having a conversation. Um, and I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but I I wanted to ask you about um, how you feel about the emergence of AI, which is going to just I guess, you know, blow things up. I mean, yeah. as far, if you want to talk about change. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's so funny. I locked in the text to this book in November of 2022 of last year before it, anyone had heard the phrase chat GPT. And then like three weeks later, I was like, oh, I'm already out of date. Like, <laughs> Well, and you could have used it. Maybe you could have used it to write your book. I know. I'm like the oh last book actually written by hand. No, so, um, <laughs> so what I think AI is... is Generative AI in particular, right? AI is is so much bigger than just what we're seeing right now with chat bots and, and chat GPT. But generative AI is so interesting because I think it is going to take over the long tail of kind of dull, remote, repeatable tasks, right? Even down to like the first draft of something. And it's going to free up people to take on the higher level, more creative, uh, more strategic roles where you have to connect the dots and you have to think in ways that the computer can't do it yet or doesn't know to do yet. Um, and so I think it's going to, I'm hopeful, this is my optimistic side, it's yes. going to allow us to have so much more um, creativity and, and fulfillment and interestingness 
in the the long kind of uh, pool of of white collar jobs that haven't necessarily been hit by some of these technological disruptions. Yeah. The pessimistic side of me says, yeah, it's going to do that by like putting a whole bunch of people out of work. <laughs> and, and, you know, like we're going to see this realignment of many, many white collar industries in ways that I think net net will create jobs, mm-hmm. but in the process is going to be incredibly disruptive. Yeah, that transition to, will be that, very, very difficult. It is. It's going to be difficult. And so I think f- for us who are in these worlds, kind of, that's great at an industry level, but like, what about me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I yeah. think this is where the portfolio life really matters. Yeah. Having different <clears throat> identities professionally, different networks of people you can tap into, different skills that you are perfectly willing to bring to bear we might have to get creative for a few years during this moment of transition as we, as we figure out how we want to make a life. Yeah. Um, and I think crucially as industries rebalance a little bit of how much they compensate for certain roles. I, I think particularly around the role of computer programmers, which for a very long time has been a very high paid, you know, six figure plus rather elite job for many folks. I think the average computer programmer salary might be depressed after all is said and done because, you know, generative AI can do a lot when it comes yeah. to writing code. Yeah, you're so right. I mean, it's just going to impact every every area of our life. And I think one, mm-hmm. one, I think I agree with you. I'm so I read a lot about what is happening, particularly in science and medicine. You know, with the AI that is going to be so um, advantageous. Mm-hmm. And you worry about bad actors, people who might use it for the wrong reasons. And that is always a worry, um, yeah. which I want to ask you as a mom, you know, mm-hmm. you mentioned you're a mom. Yes. Um, what, what keeps you up at night when you look <laughs> at your children and you think about their lives and how different they're going to be from when you grow up, when mm-hmm. I grew up, what is your greatest worry? I'll tell you what keeps me up right now uh, is my one-year-old who's teething and does not sleep through the night. Um, (laughs) Don't worry about that. (laughs) But in terms of worries, I mean, I think one of the biggest things, you know, I have a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son, and I had the great pleasure of growing up and going through adolescence without social media, without camera phones. Um, I didn't have Facebook until I was a senior in college. And even then, the first photo I ever uploaded was my graduation photo. So I got to make all of these mistakes in a world where they weren't documented. And there's no paper trail. Mm -hmm. They don't show up on a Google search. They don't make their way through the middle school before I even know that it exists. And I am incredibly terrified (laughs) about how I'm going to help navigate both of my children through that stage, but particularly my daughter. Uh, You know, we've seen the research of how much of an impact social media has on girls' self-esteem, on depression, on eating disorders, on suicide rates. And I, I am straight up terrified. I'm like secretly, not so secretly hoping all social media companies fail and implode before she turns like 10. Um, because I don't just people, you know, I think sometimes things become so big and major and then, and then there's a loss of interest. It could be, I hope, no, I, I here's hoping. (laughs) Yeah. It's, um, there's just no privacy, zero, zero privacy. Right. So that's a big concern. And then I think the other one is, is just, I'm, I'm not concerned as much, but I'm very interested to see how AI changes how we understand what is true, right? If you think about the ability to manipulate images and mm-hmm. video and sound, yes, you know, just yes. the yes. even the learning curve we needed in the last 10 years to become media savvy of how do you know that something is legitimate and trustworthy and how not and and how important it has been from everyone from teenagers through my grandparents to learn how to to trust what is true. Mm. I worry about what that looks like if you grow up in that world where you can't even trust that, you know, the the photo of your mom is a real one, right? So yeah. Yeah. it's a little bit like we're kind of entering a, a very strange chapter um, that is 
it, it's like exponentially different from the last chapter, not just, you know, a little bit different. Yeah. What do you do personally to manage the anxiety, the worry? What is your, well, I know, I mean, probably music, probably, I know you're athletic. You yes. have a lot of wonderful outlets. <laughs> I do. I, I work out four times a week. I schedule it in. It's like, I go to the same class. I work with the same trainer at the same time every single week. And I have to do that partially because it's the only way that like my husband and I can juggle gym ske schedules. So you have to do it while we have childcare, you know? Um, so, so I do work out it, like Pilates and yoga and things that also give a little bit of the mental break in addition mm -hmm. to kind of the physical activity. Um, I also, uh, I have legit like diagnosed anxiety. I take medication. <laughs> it's incredibly helpful to manage some of that yeah. um, because I tried on my own for many, many, many years. And, um, and finally I was like, you know what, if, if I were sick, I wouldn't be afraid of taking meds. Why am I afraid of, of thinking about that for my mental health? So so well, I did, a, and it's yeah, incredibly that's helpful. The, the fact that we're very open now today about understanding that the mind, you know, can be sick as well as your arm, your leg, and organ. And yeah. I think that's very beneficial for children to mm -hmm. be able to talk about that openly. Yes. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. So I'm going to ask you, um, is there someone in the world that you would love to have an opportunity to work with? Oh man, that's a really good question that I hadn't thought about before. Oh, there are so many people I would love to work with. You know, one of one of my favorites. Um, so John Legend. John Legend is not only an incredible musician, but yeah. um, most people don't know that before he became John Legend, he was a BCG consultant. I he literally. He built like Excel models and wrote slides. That man is brilliant in addition to being this incredible musician and creative. Mm -hmm. And I, I love anyone who has those sort of interesting, you know, intersections in who they are and what they can do. Yeah. I feel like That's very cool that John Legend and I could probably make something interesting happen. Well, you just put it out into the universe. It, it could happen. Um, and my last question, secret to happiness, happiness mm. you know, outside of all the things we do in life, just a contentment feeling. Yeah. Happy. The big thing that I've been trying to get across to my three-year-old, who is her stage of perfectionism right now, mm. is that in my opinion, the only failure that truly is a disaster is when you learn something is not for you right? You, a job, a relationship, a, a country, a city or whatever, you learn something. You, I thought this was for me. I have more information. It's not for me. And then you don't do anything about it. You stay, you stay in a situation that's not a fit. Anything short of that, you thought this turns out you were wrong. Like that sort of failure. That's like not a big deal. You got, it's a learning opportunity and you change directions. It's only when you thought it, you were wrong, and then you do nothing to change your circumstances. That's when I think people are going to be miserable. Wonder. Yeah, there you go. So that's great advice. You know, act on that intuition, make the change. Um, and that probably will lead to, to lifelong happiness. Yeah, that's the hope. Well, Christina, I enjoyed this conversation so much. Thank you Thank for you. taking time and good luck with the book. Thank you um, so much. And uh, I uh, will hope you'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. That's it. We are going to go into a break and we'll be right back. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. If you think severe weather has been on the rise, you are correct. In the last three years, tornado warnings in our region have shattered records. With 52 last year alone, half of those warnings resulted in confirmed tornadoes, including two extremely rare EF3s. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. Is the best vacation one that you find? Or one you get lost in? One that takes you to new heights? Or reminds you to go with the flow? 
to get your feet wet and your wheels spinning. One that lets you find your own rhythm or get carried away. Find the best of yourself. Get lost in the woods. Plan your stay in the wild woods today. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley and everywhere in between, for 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank, here we are and here we grow. There's a moment every hour, every day, every week. These moments shape our world. They add color, perspective, and sometimes pain. Moments are meant to be shared, shared by friends, family, people you trust. At Action News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome back. That's it for another week of Women to Watch. Thank you so much to Katiri for producing the show and to all of our watch team members and corporate partners and sponsors. Next week, I'll be joined by Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon. Have a great week, everyone. We are CHOP. And we can't wait to show you around. We are the nation's first children's hospital. Now, a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand. Three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space. We have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn, like our internationally recognized simulation center. We have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR-T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention. Our patients come from every state and 115 countries. Meeting these challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. Do you 
you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, this is Sue Rocco. Women to Watch is pleased to share a clip from Breaking Through, a podcast hosted by Madeline Bell, the president and CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This interview is part of a series in which Madeline interviews CHOP's women scientists about what inspires them and advice they have for other women interested in pursuing science and medicine careers. My guest today is Dr. Marnie Falk. Dr. Falk is a geneticist who specializes in caring for children with mitochondrial disease. So let's start with you describing what is mitochondrial disease and how does it impact children? Absolutely. It's very hard to look at somebody and know that their mitochondria aren't working. I give the analogy to my patients of a doll. If somebody brought you a toy doll and the doll's arm wasn't connected, you would know there was a trauma. There was something obviously wrong. But if somebody brought you that doll, let's say a child, and the doll wasn't walking and it wasn't talking and it wasn't blinking and the lights weren't going on, most parents would try to change the batteries. Well, that's what we think of as mitochondrial disease. The batteries aren't working properly. So things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, even aging. When we age, our mitochondrial DNA integrity becomes impaired. We get deletions in it and we get less mitochondria. And you know this because if you're at a party with grandkids and little kids, who's the ones running around? (laughs) It's the little kids because their energy is just so much higher because our ability to make energy goes down unless we exercise. That really helps us. (laughs) So we're still learning all the different areas where mitochondrial dysfunction is happening. We're now recognizing it's probably much more than even one in 4,300. It's probably many more of us (laughs) than we'd like to admit. To hear more of Madeline's interviews with CHOP's amazing doctors and scientists, listen to Breaking Through with Madeline Bell, available wherever you get your podcasts. It's the number one news at 10 p.m. Action news on PHL 17. Join Shari Williams, Gray Hall, Deuces Rogers, and meteorologist Adam Joseph for all the big stories at a time that's right for you. Action News at 10 p.m. on PHL 17. Now, the women to watch, military watch. Fewer than half of eligible veterans use the VA health benefits they are entitled to. But those who do use the VA, more than 80% of veterans are satisfied with the VA care. Hi, I'm Carol Eggert, Senior Vice President of Military Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. Now, you may be asking, why should this matter to me? I share this with you because most of our listeners have some connection to the veterans in their community and may have the opportunity to share information about this new VA benefit. The VA has just launched the PACT Act, which is the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxics, which is the most significant expansion of veteran benefits and care in more than three decades, empowering the VA to help millions of toxic exposed veterans and their survivors. The PACT Act expands VA health care and benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and many other toxic substances. The PACT Act adds to the list of health conditions that the VA presumes are caused by exposure to these substances. This law helps the VA provide generations of veterans and their survivors with the care and benefits they've earned and deserve. The PACT Act is the least we can do for the countless men and women who suffered toxic exposure while serving their country, said President Biden during the PACT Act bill signing ceremony. It means access to life insurance, home loan insurance, tuition benefits, and help with health care. So what can you do? Simply refer those veterans you know to va.gov and tell them to search the PACT Act to learn more. 